Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, from the perspective of the DTI, uh, thanks to the sponsors, USAID and uh, UN WIDA, and thanks to all the TIP staff for uh, all the organization. Uh, they weren't obviously able to uh, choose the weather, uh, but you can choose your bar. And uh, uh, I've seldom seen a bar as uh, depressing as the bar here, which uh, only has um, bottled water in it. So, um, <laughs> and, and uh, the, the presentation by, earlier by Wolf, uh, for the first time I heard the term uh, uh, potable alcohol. Uh, can we suggest that potable alcohol uh, is, is in the venue going forward, uh, whatever form that takes? Um, it, it, this is a, a difficult session for me. I can't be uh, perhaps as, uh, as rude as Mike was. Uh, I'm, I'm employed by government. Uh, and, and so let me just make a few observations without uh, attempting the probably the hopeless task of trying to uh, summarize either what the honorable and very hardworking minister said uh, uh, or what I think was a, a very rich uh, conference uh, and a good balance, as somebody said, between the transversal uh, policy issues and some of the uh, deeper dive value chain research and, and issues. Um, having said that, I, I just want to make uh, one observation, which is to say that obviously government's approach to regional industrial integration has to be informed by government's commitment to trade and market integration in the tripartite FTA process. Uh, apart from the important economic imperative, I thought that the minister's point yesterday uh, that unless Africa achieves an FTA, it might be in a position where African countries or, or blocs uh, have more favorable agreements with developed and OECD countries than uh, agreements in and between African countries. So my view would be notwithstanding the remarks made about the endless policy process, I don't think there's an option to do that and uh, government is certainly committed to it. Uh, although I thought that the points made by the honorable and equally hard-working Rob Davies Zimbabwe uh, were uh, very important. And perhaps one of the gaps, and I haven't been in all the sessions, is uh, a little bit of a uh, academic interrogation of, of this subject. How precisely uh, uh, or more accurately has uh, all the rent seeking, the elite pacting, the uh, 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 the um, vested interests, how are they uh, impacting very, very negatively on uh, both the policy and the practical approaches to uh, uh, the FTA uh, beyond endless churn? and the very important issues of regional industrial integration. Um, as the minister then said, as government we're very committed to regional industrial integration for all the reasons that he spelt out, uh, including the dependence on, on commodity exports, uh, greater value addition, and so on and so forth. But as we know, and as has been said here, securing an FTA is not only an incredibly difficult task in the political economy context of South Africa, 
But securing policy alignment for industrialization is perhaps uh, by multiple factors more difficult. I'd make the point, I think, that our industrial policy action plan makes is that securing policy coherence just in the South African government is perhaps the biggest impediment to a uh, laser-focused, aligned industrial strategy. And I thought the, um, the biofuels uh, example is a very good one. Uh, my colleagues, esteemed colleagues from the National Treasury know that that has been on the drawing boards in South Africa for 14 years. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, oh dear me, sorry. I'm not sure that there's any progress even as we speak. Uh, so having said that, um, just a couple of, of remarks. Um, the first would be that uh, clearly on the back of uh, rising exports to Africa, in particular in mining and transport capital goods, agro-processing pooled by uh, the expansion of uh, retail, South African retailers into uh, independent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Africa, and uh, uh, as well as uh, the expansion of uh, ICT and financing and engineering services into Africa. The first thing that, from a DTI perspective, a national perspective that we are committed to doing, working very closely with South Africa's leading companies, we have to get a better understanding of the opportunity uh, that exists in Africa and the deployment of the appropriate policy instruments and levers to support that opportunity and aligned with the imperatives uh, of regional African integration. And I was fascinated to hear Judith's uh, input in relation to the fact that our localization requirements in our export credit offering don't align with the localization uh, requirements uh, in, in Zambia. Uh, and uh, I think that's a useful example of something that we have to work with. Secondly, and more importantly, in the context of this conference, uh, the reality is that we have to and will work with SADC, both at the policy level and more importantly, with the deep dive research in regional value chains that's required. And uh, it's SADC, uh, not the DTI, that has identified uh, mineral beneficiation, agro-processing, and pharmaceuticals that should form the core of uh, that research. But let me get to perhaps the heart of the point I want to make. And those are that for the first time, uh, in my uh, understanding, we are now devoting considerable resources, not just to deep dive examination in close uh, coordination and uh, a collaborative relationship with our lead companies with respect to exports, but to practical applied research with respect to regional industrial integration opportunities. And our research going forward will not only be very well researched, uh, in coordination with the Industrial Development Corporation and the Development Bank of South Africa, taking into account the necessity to uh, address the constraints and align the opportunities with the realities uh, of the energy problems, the infrastructure, the skills, and so on and so forth. But for the first time, include uh, academics and policy makers from the subcontinent in the research 
and look at uh, this work starting with what we believe are the key sectors. The mining and transport capital equipment, the upstream sector, autos, where as you heard yesterday from former Minister Irwin, we are working very closely with Nigeria, including with respect to the possibilities of an industrial agreement uh, to cooperate and collaborate in the auto sector and agro-processing. Uh, and perhaps another important sector which we haven't mentioned, uh, uh, or certainly that I haven't heard in this forum, is oil and gas. Uh, I think it's, uh, the, some of the data is a little bit uh, disputed, but on the east and west coast of Africa uh, sits somewhere in the region of 15% of global oil and gas reserves. And uh, with respect to Mozambique, the li liquid natural gas and uh, South Africa's uh, Waterberg and Botswana's uh, coal bed methane, this is up there globally with respect to uh, liquid natural gas and coal bed methane as well as uh, shale gas. So we think this is a very significant opportunity and it lies not only with respect to a gas-based industrialization strategy, uh, lowering the cost of energy, uh, carbon mitigation, uh, the upstream mining and, uh, and transport equipment sector, and the downstream petrochemicals, ceramics, and other sectors. So our approach uh, unequivocally now is to move into much deeper dive research to identify the opportunities that exist starting uh, in those value chains as I've said, to involve researchers, institutions, and policymakers from the SADC and wider African uh, uh, region, and uh, to hopefully break the endless churn which has been in the space of policy. So in conclusion, our broader research and policy development effort, in that effort, we are very keen to support an active industrial policy network, both in South Africa and in the broader region. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, participate and listen to the very important contributions. And we look forward to working with you in a much closer way as we go forward. Thank you. I would now like to ask um, Judith to come up. Um, Judith Fishai is um, from CCRED, which is the Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development, based at, uh, it's a very long name, based at um, University of Johannesburg. Um, she's gonna share with us some of the, her insights um, from the conference. Thank you, Sol. Um, first of all, thanks to TIPS for organizing such an interesting conference. Um, I think we have seen very important presentations on sectors with, uh, uh, with a high potential for regional industrializations, um, motor vehicles, ethanol, uh, poultry and uh, soybeans, mineral beneficiations, and mining inputs. Um, we have seen studies across countries and subregions for the Gauteng City region, Zambia, Mozambique and Malawi, and we have seen research on cross-cutting areas that are very important for supporting um, regional industrialization. Um, the FTAs, trade facilitation, energy, transport regulations, and the relationship with China. I would like to make just two quick points. One is on the challenges of institutional capabilities in the regions, and the other one is um, on why I think um, regional partnerships um, are very important in terms of research going forward. Um, on the first point, uh, the region has seen very important changes in the past 10 years in terms of large investment in extractive industries, infrastructure, urbanization, and rising demand from the middle class. Um, looking at the supply response, I think what's coming out from all of this research 
um, is that we have seen growing relationships in terms of production, investment, and trade networks across borders. Um, to a certain extent, the private sector has moved ahead of policymakers um, in developing their regional strategies. So policymakers now have to catch up in most of the countries and craft coherent industrial policies that actually take into account the regional dimension. Um, regional cooperation in, the, in industrial development, however, requires even more capable institutions at the national level, not less. Um, FDI, trade facilitation, infrastructure are all very important, but building firm level capabilities in terms of acquiring new technologies, learning new organizational and management uh, techniques, developing su uh, supply network, creating a competent workforce that are all challenges in most of the region, um, require very sophisticated and focused domestic institutions. Such institutions will have also to implement a regional agenda and to coordinate um, with SADC, with South Africa, and with other relevant uh, policymakers. There are different levels of institutional capabilities in the region as far as industrial policy is concerned, especially on the implementation side. Um, I think there are very important lessons to learn from um, South Africa, uh, from Botswana on the diamond beneficiation policy, from Ethiopia, for example, on the leather, um, on the leather industry. Um, however, in most of the countries, this type of policies in terms of design and implementation remain a challenge. Um, this is also the case with some of the regional institutions that are supposed to support these, uh, these policies at national level. Um, this is why I think there is a lot of space for sharing experiences, and South Africa should play a pivotal role in that respect. Um, even if any country at the end of the day will have to face its own specificity and, and design specific institutions. In terms of the research uh, community, um, a lot more research is needed to improve our understanding of how regional value chains are structured and what are the implications for industrial development. Um, at UJ, we are doing uh, work on these kind of issues, for example, trying to understand how the strategies of lead firms impact on regional industrialization, how monopolies and cartels organized at regional level affect competitiveness of downstream uh, industries at regional level, and whether there are conflicting policies, such as import and export bans and local content policies. Um, most importantly, how will cooperation in the area of industrial development look like? How do you create win-win outcomes where both South Africa and the region see their own industrialization processes uh, supported? Um, there is, however, some level of skepticism in the region on whether a regional industrialization agenda would really deliver win-win outcome and not only for the South, Af South Africa being the powerhouse of the, um, of the region. And for countries, I think, to be receptive to any policy recommendations coming out from research on regional industrialization, mm -hmm. I think the research itself must build on a, a shared understanding of what regional industrialization is and what it entails and um, what are the priorities in, some, in terms of a shared research agenda. Um, in this respect, I agree with the previous speaker that partnerships with research institutes are absolutely critical. Well, thank you very much and, and good afternoon to everybody and it's just great to see old friends here and new friends here and I'm really thankful to be on this platform. What I want to do, it's a bit ambitious, but I want to relate to some of the big issues that I think are there in development and industrialization, relate that then to regional issues and then finally I do want to say something, try and say something concrete about what I think the sort of policies that the DTI, which is the lead agency, might actually follow. Uh, going forward, both in the region and, and perhaps a little bit more broadly. I'm always controversial. Lots of things I say people don't agree with, and I'll try to limit my controversy, but to, be, to at least be blunt and direct. And then at least I think that allows for some discussion to happen. So the first thing that seems to me to be really important if we look at the issue of manufacturing and development is that we are seeing premature deindustrialization as a global phenomenon. What's clear is that countries are turning around. If you look at the share of manufacturing employment in total employment, 
it's decreasing all the time in terms of, of where the turnaround comes. So take an example. When Germany industrialized, at the peak, 38% of Germans worked in industry. Now, when we industrialize, we've reached our peak at about 20. Brazil reached its peak at about 22. Mexico has reached its peak. We're all seeing decline. So we're all seeing, if you like, deindustrialization in this form. And it's a global phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. So what's happening, in a sense, is manufacturing's ability to absorb unskilled labor, raise the productivity, and so promote development is declining. This is very important. It doesn't mean manufacturing is unimportant. It means it's enormously important. But we have to be careful. Our whole spring for development doesn't re can't really depend on, on manufacturing. We've got to look also at other areas, and particularly other traded areas, to provide employment opportunities and productivity opportunities. We must be careful to see this not as, a, as, as, as purely manufacturing-led, but critically some of the other areas, the traded areas, and I'll come to that, become important. Now, South Africa, we said, uh, deindustrialized prematurely. So it is true. We look at South Africa, we've probably reached our turnaround point. It's probably in about 90, in the, in the early 1990s, we had about 22% of people in manufacturing employment as a share. We're now down to something like, like uh, probably about 10 or 11%. So it's only one-tenth of our population is working in manufacturing, and that's... There are some possibilities, but that's likely to continue to decline. We see it declining every year. Now, why? Why should South Africa have prematurely deindustrialized? And there are a number of factors, but I want to just point to one. So take a, a, an interesting statistic. There are now almost more people employed in private sector uh, security than there are in the manufacturing sector. That sector has grown enormously, massively. Why? It's a function of demand. You and me and other middle class people whose incomes are rising, that's what we prepare to pay for. And because we prepare to pay for it, that's what grows. And when the security companies go to the banks and ask for money, they get it because they've got good customers out there who pay. It's got nothing to do with the structure of South Africa that's from with the industrial structure of South Africa that's promoted this. It's a demand-led thing, and it's not a problem of finance. It's a problem of where the demand is. And again, if you want to say it, behind the demand lies some income distribution issues. South Africa, unequal distribution of income, richer buy more services than they do manufacturing. We had a different distribution of income. Our turnaround would come later. So, so South Africa... we. Industry is terribly important. I don't want to get that wrong. But don't look to industry as our sole source of development and certainly not as our sole source of, of employment creation. Other areas are going to be much more critical and we're going to probably continue to shed labour. Second phenomenon that I'd look at uh, if, we, if we ask what's happening in the global phenomenon is the enormous growth in South-South trade and investment. So here's some data. If you look at, sorry, DC here stands for develop, developing countries, South-South. So look at the import content, look at the import relationship, and you see how massively our imports, developing country imports, have grown from other developing countries. Now that's in general, look at it in capital goods, look at it even in high tech, uh, in high tech areas. Now, admittedly, there's often a very high import content in this trade, but it's the trend that's important. It's the trend that's important. Uh, southern, southern countries, developing countries, are trading to a much greater extent amongst each other. Sure, a lot of that's China, some of that's India, but believe me, some of it's Brazil and some of it's South Africa as well. Similarly, on, this, on the growth of South-South investment, we're seeing much more investment from southern countries into other southern countries, in Africa, in the last while, if you read the World, Development, uh, World uh, uh, Investment Report, we've seen declines in FBI by many developed countries. The UK, for example, has reduced its investment in Africa. Some of those investments have been taken up by developing country firms. And it's a major area for South African uh, uh, outward foreign direct investment in this, in this area in Southern Africa, particularly in areas of retail, finance, and others. So, South Africa exports to Africa and South Africa's growth of investment in Africa is part of a global, uh, global uh, 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 phenomenon. Countries all over are investing, developing countries all over are investing in their regions and they're trading more with their regions. And we've seen major growth, 
since the mid-2000s, essentially, not the mid-200s, the mid-2000s. So now, about 50% of our, of our manufactured exports go to Africa, and even larger proportion, 60% of our service exports go to Africa. And, of course, we've seen major increases in our outward foreign direct investment going into Africa. So, that's kind of good news, right? It's a, it's a good news story. It's not altogether a good news story. One of the reasons why we're seeing growth in our regional trade is precisely because we've got very slow growth in our domestic markets. So if you're, if you're a manufacturing firm and you've got slow growth in your domestic markets, you've got a bit of excess capacity, the easiest place to go to to, 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 to sell some of your goods is in the African market. So not all of this is a good news story. We have to differentiate the kind of opportunistic type uh, um, exporting that we have from the exporting that we really want, which is to establish a permanent presence and to grow exports uh, uh, in, in, in a substantive way. So I think we need, one issue we need to look at, I think, is to try to see how we can work with those exporters, not all exporters, but those exporters who could become more permanent in the, in the, in the African marketplace, and I want to say something about that. Now, the DTI has done one very excellent thing in the last while. Very, I don't often praise the DTI, but the DTI does some wonderful things. And amongst the really... Miracles happen. Miracles happen. And amongst the really good things that the DTI has done, sits very close to the back of this room there. Nigel Gwyn Evans, who I've worked with a lot in the Western Cape, is, our, is the DTI point man on, 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 on the region. And Nigel's a great guy. I don't know anybody... See, I'm not... He's a friend of mine, but I'm not just praising him. But I don't know anybody in the, in the area who's done as much work with firms, talking to firms, and has as good a rapport. And I think he will do great things. I think we'll watch it all. Nigel's starting point will be the IPAP, right? And the IPAP says, gives three priorities in the region. Uh, if you look at the IPAP, one of the transversal things is the region. And the stress, as, as Garth has said earlier, is the three targets, if you like, or focuses are agro-processing, mineral beneficiation, and pharmaceuticals. I didn't realize those weren't the DTI choices. It was interesting that you said that that was, but those are the three that come up in the IPAP. Now, I think we have to ask, what are the criteria? What are the, why, why, why are those targets? I think we also need to ask, what about services? Now, as I said, 60% of our service uh, exports are now going to Africa. And there's enormous opportunity here enormous opportunity and there are things that can be affected for example recognition of education qualifications right to open up educational institutions etc there are obviously real possibilities in the service sector imagine if we allowed firms and we've I've talked about this uh, uh, at lunch yesterday but imagine if we allowed firms in South Africa that were exporting services skilled services to bring people in from outside South Africa, twinned it to an, an immigration policy. Here I am, I'm an engineering consulting firm. I bring in Mr. Singh from India to do some work in Zambia. I pay Mr. Singh 500,000 uh, a year, which I get from my export revenues from Zambia. Mr. Singh pays his taxes, 100,000 a year. Government's got more money to spend. There, there, are lots of, there are lots of backward linkages and possibilities that really allow for service growth. And I think it's an area that really needs major attention. So we must be careful. I mean, we slip and slide a bit, but we often talk about regional industrial strategy. Let's talk about it as a regional economic strategy, if you like, or certainly make sure that the industrial doesn't in some way preclude or indeed even particularly privilege industrial activities. Lots of possibilities in the services sector. So I've said that South African manufacturing exports the region, I'll talk about that now, is not all good news. There are lots of opportunistic exporters. So which firms do we target? What activities do we support? And what sort of supports should we give? So those are three questions I want to try and address. OK, I'll, let me address those. What, what happens when an exporter gets into a market? If they're doing it purely opp opportunistically, I'm making a widget for the South African market, demand's bad, I know that there's not much growth here, I'm going to send my stuff over the border to Zimbabwe or somewhere. That's not an export who's gonna, we're going to be able to do much with. It's a vent for surplus issue. We've got to find and identify those exporters who will enter the regional markets on a more permanent basis. So what we want to do, in my view, 
is we want to say to firms, if you establish a permanent basis of exporting in the region, we will support that activity. So, for example, a firm that wants to set up a sales center or a repair center or a maintenance center or do a substantive market study of the region, those are the kind of activities the DTI, I think, could support. Any activities that are going to make exporters not opportunistic, but to establish some kind of base in those areas. You don't give them all the money they need, but you might say, listen, if you're going to build up a repair center in Zambia, it's going to cost you 100 rand. We'll put 30, you put 70 of your own money. So really, I think we are looking, I think, to support the, the uh, expenses that will make these firms uh, uh, permanent exporters. This is, this is the export hysteresis story that we know we, we've had for so long. When, when firms go in to an export market and they spend money, they tend to stay. So if you spend fixed money in an, in an area, you stay in that area. You try to exploit it as much as you can increase. And that's, that's the kind of support I think that we can do in the regional context. That's the kind of exporting, the kind of activity that I think I think we could, we could, uh, we could work with. Um, I want to come back to two further global issues. First one's the imports of manufacturers from China. Now, we all think of China's exports of manufacturers as being bad for manufacturing in South Africa and in Africa generally, but it's not all bad for employment and indeed it's not all bad for manufacturing. Two issues. One is, of course, cheap Chinese goods, consumer goods, have major impacts on consumer welfare, help the poor, help consumers generally. But even more significant and, and, and really often neglected, China, now India, Brazil's coming not far behind, are now exporting into the African context a whole range of capital equipment, which is cheaper, more robust, more attuned to developing country context, more labor intensive. So we're seeing small scale tractors, for small-scale farmers. We're seeing uh, 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 metal cutting machines. We're seeing cheaper sewing machines. Lots of capital equipment that's coming in from China is actually employment creating. It, it lowers barriers to entry. It's often labor intensive. And this capital equipment is enormously important. And so just to, to raise the issue, we should be very careful about issues of you know, China being uh, I mean, there, there, there are situations, of course, Chinese imports in, of clothing into South Africa have wreaked havoc here, etc., not just Chinese, but from other countries as well. But don't forget the capital goods side of it, and don't forget the welfare side of it. Very, very important. So be careful of any trade kind of issues which try to restrict those imports that may have unintended consequences. The second issue about China, which is a, the last one which I'll close on, may be the most controversial is that the big story at the moment is global relocation of manufacturing investment. So, as we know, wages are starting to rise in China. Clothing firms, footwear firms, toy firms, furniture firms are looking for, no for other locations. Cheap labor cost locations where the unit cost of labor is low. These are labor intensive issues, labor intensive manufacturers. And where are they going? They're going to countries like Cambodia and Vietnam. And it's not just that wages are rising in China. Wages are rising in those countries as well. Is this an opportunity for South Africa? Now, very critically, if you look at deindustrialization in South Africa, look at where we've done badly. We've really done badly in the labor-intensive areas. 60% of our employment loss in manufacturing has been in clothing, textiles, and footwear. We are not competitive. We're just not. Now, Competition in these areas depends critically on the wage and the productivity story. So let me tell you, here, here's, a, here, here's what I'm working on. Cambodia has 650,000 people in clothing. 650,000. More and more firms are locating from China into Cambodia. I'm asking what is the wage in, 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 in Cambodia and what is the productivity of Cambodian workers relative to South Africans? And lo and behold, you find now that Cambodians are agitating for higher wages. They're getting about $9 a day. Now, that's still substantially below what our clothing wages are. But think about an area like the Eastern Cape. Think about Port Elizabeth. 
Lots of people in the Eastern Cape and elsewhere in the country are going to work for public works programs because they are desperate for work, and they'll work at 75 rand a day. Now, if we had factories employing people at 75 rand a day, we would be very we would be lower than Cambodia wage costs. What about the productivity side? Well, productivity side in East Asia, in Cambodia, people are coming from the countryside to the urban areas straight into factories. Our people have worked in, we have many people who've worked in factories before, trained in factories, long urbanized, <coughs> not brilliantly educated, our education is obviously not great, but by comparison with Cambodia, well educated. So people who've worked in South Africa and in Cambodia tell you that South African workers are more productive. So I think we can be more productive on a unit labor cost than Cambodia. There is an opportunity, there's a big opportunity here for us. So the, tr the traditional trajectory which tells us that these areas, etc., are, 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 are where we're not competitive, we can be competitive. Of course, there's a big issue about deregulating the labor market, big issue. But the issue about deregulating the labor market, as I understand it, is oppositional from the unions who concern that if you deregulate the labor market, you will have cheap labor competing with the high cost labor, which they fought so long to, 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 uh, for the wages, the decent wages that we've got. We talk about decent wages. And I understand that. I think that's absolutely right. But let's say we set up an export processing zone, and it's all for exports. And let's say it was successful. Let's say we had 100,000 people working in Kocha and PE, exporting clothing and widgets to Japan. Any downward pressure on established wages? No. So I think there are real possibilities here. I mean, I think we should be possibly looking to deregulate the labor market more widely. Politically, I don't think that that's possible. Maybe export processing zones, a special form of SEZs, is one thing that we need to look at. But certainly, we need to put on the table that what has happened in South Africa is that we, we, we have uniquely large numbers of people who already have industrial skills. Our wages are not anymore that high relative to other countries. And we need to make a much more consistent effort, I think, a substantive effort, to see if we can attract some of those jobs. Now, Justin Lin says there are 85 million jobs going in the next 10, 15 years. I don't believe that number, but let's say it's 40. And let's say we get 0.5 of a percent of that. Won't resolve our unemployment problem, won't, resolve, won't, won't, won't change anything on a dramatic scale, but it will change. Not only because we'll generate jobs, but because we'll generate exports. And exports, I think, are really critical in this process. Thank you.